Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible, praise God, is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study in the book by Andrew Murray, which is titled Absolute Surrender. And before we begin today, I want to let you know that we began this series with a study entitled The Road to Calvary. There were three parts to that study. We next talked about the book Humility by Andrew Murray. As I stated, we are currently in Absolute Surrender by Andrew Murray. And once we complete that, we're going to take a look at a book called Love Not the World by a man called Watchman Nee. Now, once we complete that in our one a day series, and we will create a separate playlist for it as well, but we're going to begin a study on a book called The Spiritual Man by Watchman Nee as well. Now, you can pick this up from Amazon.com. You can pick this up from ChristianBook.com and various other places. But I would highly encourage you to pick up a copy because as you can see, this is a pretty lengthy book. And so this is a series that is probably going to carry us throughout the rest of the year. Now, just to give you an example, some of the chapters are titled Spirit, Soul, and Body, Spirit and Soul, The Fall of Man, The Flesh and Salvation, The Cross and the Holy Spirit, The Believer's Ultimate Attitude Toward the Flesh, The Experience of Soulish Believers, The Dangers of of soulish life. And so as you can follow along with us through this series, I wanted to bring this to your attention so that you can pick up a copy for yourself and you can follow along with us. Well, with that being said, let's pick up today in chapter two of Absolute Surrender. Chapter two is titled, The Fruit of the Spirit is Love. Now I want to look at the fact of a life filled with the Holy Spirit more from the practical side and to show how this life will show itself in our daily walk and conduct. Under the Old Testament, you know the Holy Spirit often came upon men as a divine spirit of revelation to reveal the mysteries of God or for power to do the work of God. But he did not then dwell in them. Now many just want the Old Testament gift of power for work but they know very little of the New Testament gift of the indwelling spirit, animating and renewing the whole life. When God gives the Holy Spirit, his great object is the formation of a holy character. It is a gift of a holy mind and spiritual disposition. And what we need above everything else is to say, I must have the Holy Spirit sanctifying my whole inner life if I am really to live for God's glory. You might say that when Christ promised the Spirit to the disciples, he did so that they might have power to be witnesses. True, but then they received the Holy Ghost in such heavenly power and reality that he took possession of their whole being at once and so fitted them as holy men for doing the work with power as they had to do it. Christ spoke of power to the disciples, but it was the Spirit filling their whole being that worked the power. I wish now to dwell upon the passage found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love. We read that love is the fulfilling of the law. This is in Romans 13:10. And my desire is to speak on love as a fruit of the Spirit, with a twofold objective. One objective is that this word may be a searchlight in our hearts and give us a test by which to try all our thoughts about the Holy Spirit and all our experience of the holy life. Let us try ourselves by this word. Has this been our daily habit? to seek being filled with the Holy Spirit as the spirit of love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, we are told. Has it been our experience that the more we have of the Holy Spirit, the more loving we become? In claiming the Holy Spirit, 
We should make this the first objective of our expectation. The Holy Spirit comes as a spirit of love. Oh, if this were true in the church of Christ, how different her state would be. May God help us to get hold of this simple heavenly truth, that the fruit of the Spirit is a love which appears in the life, and that just as the Holy Spirit gets real possession of the life, the heart will be filled with real divine universal love. A second objective is to show that one of the great causes why God cannot bless his church is the want of love. When the body is divided, there cannot be strength. In the time of their great religious wars, when Holland stood out so nobly against Spain, one of their mottos was, unity gives strength. It is only when God's people stand as one body, one before God in the fellowship of love, one toward another in deep affection, one before the world in a love that the world can see. It is only then that they will have power to secure the blessing which they ask of God. Remember that if a vessel that ought to be one whole is cracked into many pieces, it cannot be filled. You can take a potsherd, one part of a vessel, and dip out a little water into that. But if you want the vessel full, the vessel must be whole. That is literally true of Christ's church. And if there is one thing we must pray for still, it is this. Lord, melt us together into one by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit, who at Pentecost made them all of one heart and all of one soul, May he do his blessed work among us. Praise God, we can love each other in a divine love, for the fruit of the Spirit is love. Give yourself up to love, friends, and the Holy Spirit will come. Receive the Spirit, and he will teach you to love more. Now, why is it that the fruit of the Spirit is love? Because God is love. And what does that mean? It is the very nature and being of God to delight in communicating himself. God has no selfishness. God keeps nothing to himself. God's nature is to always be giving. In the sun and the moon and the stars, in every flower you see, in every bird in the air, and in every fish in the sea, God communicates life to his creatures, and the angels around his throne, the seraphim and the cherubim, they are flames of fire, and this fire represents the holiness of God. But where do they get such glory? It is because God is love, and he imparts to them of his brightness and his blessedness. And we, his redeemed children, God delights to pour his love into us. And why? Because, as I said, God keeps nothing for himself. From eternity, God had his only begotten Son, and the Father gave him all things, and nothing that God had was kept back. God is love. One of the old church fathers said that we cannot better understand the Trinity than as a revelation of divine love. The Father, the loving one, the fountain of love. The Son, the Beloved One, the Reservoir of Love, in whom the love was poured out, and the Spirit, the living love that united both and overflowed now into this world. The Spirit of Pentecost, the Spirit of the Father, and the Spirit of the Son is love. And when the Holy Spirit comes to us and to other men, will He be less a Spirit of love? than he is in God? It cannot be. He cannot change his nature. The Spirit of God is love, and the fruit of the Spirit is love. Why is that so? That was the one great need of mankind. That was the thing which Christ's redemption came to accomplish, to restore love to this world. When man sinned, why was it that he sinned? selfishness triumphed. 
He sought self instead of God. And just look, Adam at once begins to accuse the woman of having led him astray. Love to God had gone. Love to man was lost. Look again. Of the first two children of Adam, the one becomes a murderer of his brother. Does not that teach us that sin had robbed the world of love? Ah, what a proof the history of the world has been of love having been lost. There may have been beautiful examples of love even among the heathen, but only as a little remnant of what was lost. One of the worst things sin did for man was to make him selfish, for selfishness cannot love. The Lord Jesus Christ came down from heaven as the Son of God's love. We are told God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God's Son came to show what love is, and he lived a life of love here upon earth in fellowship with his disciples, in compassion over the poor and miserable in love even to his enemies, and he died the death of love. And when he went to heaven, whom did he send down? The spirit of love, to come and banish selfishness and envy and pride, and to bring the love of God into the hearts of men. The fruit of the spirit is love. And what was the preparation for the promise of the Holy Spirit? You know that promise as found in the 14th chapter of John's gospel. But remember what proceeds in the 13th chapter. Before Christ promised the Holy Spirit, he gave a new commandment. And about that new commandment, he said wonderful things. One thing that he said was, Even as I have loved you, so love ye one another. To them, his dying love was to be the only law of their conduct and intercourse with each other. What a message to those fishermen, to those men full of pride and selfishness. Learn to love each other, said Christ, as I have loved you. And by the grace of God, they did it. When Pentecost came, they were of one heart and one soul. Christ did it for them. And now he calls us to dwell and to walk in love. He demands that though a man hate you, still you love him. True love cannot be conquered by anything in heaven or upon the earth. The more hatred there is, the more love triumphs through it all and shows its true nature. This is the love that Christ commanded his disciples to exercise. What more did he say? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one to another. You all know what it is to wear a badge, and Christ said to his disciples, in effect, I give you a badge, and that badge is love. That is to be your mark. It is the only thing in heaven or on earth by which men can know me. Do we not begin to fear that love has fled from the earth? That if we were to ask the world, have you seen us wear the badge of love? that the world would say, no, what we have heard of the church of Christ is that there is not a place where there is no quarreling and separation. Let us ask God with one heart that we may wear the badge of Jesus's love. God is able to give it. The fruit of the spirit is love. Why? Because nothing but love can expel and conquer our selfishness. Self is the great curse whether in its relation to God or to our fellow man in general or to fellow Christians. Thinking of ourselves and seeking our own is our curse. Self is our greatest curse. But praise God, Christ came to redeem us from self. We sometimes talk about deliverance from the self-life, and we thank God for every word that can be said about it to help us. But I am afraid some people think deliverance from the self-life means that now they are going to have no longer any trouble in serving God. And they forget that deliverance from self-life means to be a vessel overflowing with love to everyone all the day. And there you have the reason why many people pray for the power of the Holy Ghost 
and they get something, but oh, so little because they prayed for power for work and power for blessing, but they have not prayed for power for full deliverance from self. That means not only the righteous self in intercourse with God, but the unloving self in intercourse with men. And there is deliverance. The fruit of the Spirit is love. I bring you the glorious promise of Christ that he is able to fill our hearts with love, his love. A great many of us try hard at times to love. We try to force ourselves to love. And I do not say that this is wrong. It is better than nothing, but the end of it is always very sad. When we say to ourselves, I fail continually. And what is the reason for our failure? The reason is simply this, because they have never learned to believe and accept the truth that the Holy Spirit can pour God's love into their heart. That blessed text, often it has been limited when it says the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. We often understand it to say it means the love of God to me. Oh, what a limitation. That is only the beginning. The love of God is always the love of God in its entirety, in its fullness as an indwelling power, a love of God to me that leaps back to him in love and overflows to my fellow men in God's love for me and my love for God and my love to my fellow men. The three are one. You cannot separate them. Do believe that the love of God can be shed abroad in your heart, friend, and that we can love all the day long. Ah, you say, how little I have understood that. Think about it like this. Why is a lamb always gentle? Because that is its nature. Does it cost the lamb any trouble to be gentle? No. Why not? It is so beautiful and gentle. It was created that way. Has a lamb to study to be gentle? No. Why does it come so easy for the lamb to be gentle? Because it is in its nature. And a wolf, why does it cost a wolf no trouble to be cruel and to put its fangs into the poor lamb or sheep? Because that is its nature. It has not to summon up its courage. The wolf nature is there. And so how can we learn to love? Never until the Spirit of God fills our hearts with God's love. And then we begin to long for God's love in a very different sense from which we have sought it so selfishly, as a comfort and a joy and a happiness and a pleasure to myself. Never until we begin to learn that God is love and to claim it and receive it as an indwelling power for self-sacrifice Never until we begin to see that our glory, our blessedness is to be like God and like Christ in giving up everything in ourselves for our fellow men, it is only then, friend, we will know the full essence of the love of God, of the Spirit of God in our lives. May God teach us that. Oh, the divine blessedness of the love with which the Holy Spirit can fill our hearts. For as we have been reminded so many times, friends, and yet we cannot hear it enough, the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence of the Spirit in our lives of the Holy Almighty God is love. Well, that brings us halfway through chapter 2, friends. We're going to close there today. We'll pick up next on Love is God's Gift. And I trust that you are learning through this study that the Spirit of God is not a reaction nor an emotion, but the Spirit of God is an inner working of the heart that removes selfishness and self-centeredness and truly causes us to love as Jesus himself loved. Now, as he so wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you, and I'll see you on the next video.